except uh, myself uh, and the court personnel. Um, uh, defendant is appearing with attorney Mark Richards. And uh, can you other folks identify yourselves, please? Uh, Good afternoon, Your Honor. Steve Art, I'm here on behalf of John Huber and Karen Bloom, who are the parents of Anthony Huber. Mr. Huber is here with us today in the yellow and would like to address the court if possible. All right, and uh, there's also Mr. Gage uh, uh, Grosskreutz, am I pronouncing it right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, um, and um, there's uh, Kimberly Matley coming in right now. Okay, and would you identify yourself, please, ma'am? Uh, Ms. Madley, would you identify uh, your interest in the case? Okay. I'm sorry, yes, I'm representing... I can I'm hear sorry. you. Yes. Sorry, um, Your Honor. Good afternoon. I'm representing um, Gage Grosskroy as well as the estate of Joseph Rosenbaum. All right. Uh, and it's here on motions, as I indicated. And uh, I think the first was uh, brought by the state. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Zaff, uh, uh, I did review all the written materials were submitted. So if you want to add something to what you've already supplied, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the state had filed a motion to increase the defendant's bond by $200,000 and asked the court to issue an arrest warrant for the defendant uh, because he's violated 969.10, which requires him to update his address with the court within 48 hours of any change of address. I want to stress, uh, as the court is aware, I think everybody's aware, this is a very unusual situation to have someone facing these types of charges who has been released from custody. Typically, in a case like this, the courts set a substantial cash bond, upwards of a million dollars or more. In this case, it's $2 million. That's obviously a large amount of money for anyone to post. In this case, Mr. Rittenhouse was fortunate that his case drew the attention of people around the country who donated money to a foundation that was uh, run by attorney. Let me, let me interrupt. Let me interrupt you, for, if I might, for a moment. Uh, I did actually... Um watch the uh, video of the initial appearance and um, you already knew this at that time and in fact you brought it to Judge Keating's attention uh, that uh, the defendant, uh, that you did not believe the defendant was living at the Illinois address and uh, that was living in a, that he was living in a safe house and, and so I guess my starting issue is uh, if this has already been presented and, and argued before Judge Keating, um, what triggered the the motion now? What specifically triggered it is the return uh, that the court received. Uh, when the court mailed notice to the defendant on December 22nd, indicating that there was an arraignment on this case on January 5th, uh, that was meant, sent to the Anita Terrace address in Antioch, which was the address on record for the defendant. It was returned to the court, to your honor, on January 28th of this year, indicating that there was no one uh, by that name at that address and they were unable to forward it to uh, Mr. Rittenhouse. Uh, that was confirmation that the defendant uh, no longer received mail at that address, was no longer living there. The court is correct that I made a statement at the initial appearance that I did not believe Mr. Rittenhouse was residing at that address, but that was not, uh, I did not know that he was no longer, that there was no one there anymore. Uh, I wondered if it was a situation where the family continued to maintain that residence, but they were spending their nights in a hotel or at someone else's house. Uh, that's not unusual, uh, but I didn't know they moved out entirely. Um, and ultimately, uh, whether I know this or not is not the salient factor. The uh, 968 9.10 requires the defendant to notify the court. Uh, this is a court order. Uh, the court is the one who issues the bond, not me. And even though I had suspicions the defendant might be spending his nights in a safe house or, or uh, spending time elsewhere, um, I didn't know where that was. 
Uh, no one notified me of that. I still don't know where that's at. I have no idea where the defendant is spending his time. The court has no idea where he's spending his time. And that's a very unusual and dangerous situation when you have someone facing these types of charges in this case. As I was saying, this is a very unusual situation to have someone uh, facing these charges who's out there free on bond. And what makes this even more uh, unique is that the defendant has no stake whatsoever in that bond. There's no financial incentive for him to comply with bond. He's posted none of the money that's been uh, the $2 million. In fact, there's some sort of dispute going on right now between attorney John Pierce, who posted the bond. I don't, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into that. Well, I understand, Your Honor, but I think this is uh, salient because... The bond is up. We've got the cash here, so I'm not going to... I don't care about a feud between a lawyer and somebody else. My only point, Your Honor, is that from the defendant's perspective, uh, what incentive does he have to comply with the bond? What incentive does he have to ensure that the non-monetary conditions are met here? And there's a, a very small incentive here for him to do that. When facing charges like this, there's a very large incentive for him not to comply, not to come back to court, because there's a, a great risk here. He could be spending the rest of the li his life in prison. So when we look at that context, there's very little wiggle room here. The defendant, I think, needs to be kept on a very short leash. We need to make sure that he's compliant with every single part of that bond, which is why I filed this motion. And the defense has admitted it. There is no dispute from the defense that they, do, they have not complied with 969.10. There is no dispute. They've acknowledged he hasn't resided at that, at, at that address. And wait, I want to- wait wait, 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 well, let's, is that what the statute says? Nice. Because when I looked at the statute, um, <clears throat> which I do periodically, but uh, this one certainly brought it back to my attention again. And um, actually what it says, nine, it's 969.03 subsection 1, which, uh, pertaining to people charged with felonies. And it says the judge may, in addition to setting a, get, requiring a cash deposit, impose conditions which uh, will secure appearance for trial. And on, under subsection B, the statute says, place restrictions on the travel associations or place of abode. Now, I do that with some degree of frequency with people. And that is the percentage would be very low, would be in the low single digits. But if I get somebody who's out, already out on bond, for example, on a fourth DWI, uh, which uh, I'm really quite uncomfortable with, uh, I will put them on a um, house arrest, uh, and we require their address. They have to be there. They're allowed to, for, often to go to work, but otherwise they have to be in their house. That's a restriction on the place of abode, and it's authorized by statute. You didn't ask for that at the first appearance, and Judge Keating didn't order it. So I don't think it's correct to say that the defendant is required to live at the Antioch address, actually, or any other address. Well, according to Wisconsin statutes 969.10, Your Honor, a person who has been released on bail or other conditions shall, this is mandatory, shall give written notice to the clerk of court of any change in his address within 48 hours after the change. This shall be printed on all bonds, which it was done here. That was not complied. Yeah, that's with right. I, I'm not complied with that. I, I'm not. I, I I agree with you there. Um, but y your statement was he wasn't living there and he was required to, and I don't think that's an accurate statement. And I I because think having an address for the receipt of court notices, uh, which may come in for a variety of reasons, change of date or whatever. Having an address, and, and in fact, when we tell these people, um, when they give us an address, we say, and, and some people, for example, are homeless, um, and, or they're staying with aunts, uh, two nights here and three nights there, and re rather than locking them up, we say, here's the you have to give us an address, and you're responsible for any mail that's sent there. And that's what I interpret uh, the necessity to give an address to mean. It, it does not equate with uh, 
placing a, a restriction on the place of abode, which is specifically uh, a feature in the statute that the court can order, but I couldn't find any record that that was ordered by Judge Keating uh, or that you requested it. I agree with what you're saying, Your Honor, and I think the, the distinction you're making between an address and a place of residence is an, an important distinction in the statutes, and I do understand <laughs> that the, there may be a difference between those two things. Ultimately, Your Honor, I think this is a case where it would be important for the court to know exactly where the defendant is living. As I said, this is an extremely serious case, and I think that it's important that we don't know a P.O. box. We know exactly where the defendant is because of the risk of intimidation to witnesses, the risk to the community. And ultimately, Your Honor, I want to make it clear to anyone who's watching this that the Anita Terrace address which was on record for the defendant, is no longer his address. It is not associated with him. There is someone new and innocent who's residing there and should be free from any contact, mail, people bothering them, anything like that. You know, the defense is going to argue and has argued in their written submissions that they need to keep the defendant's whereabouts confidential because of fear for his safety. Now someone new has moved into the defendant's former apartment and that person is in jeopardy. That person is at risk from the things that the defendant is fearful of. And as recently as 20 days ago, on January 22nd, the defendant misrepresented, he lied about his address to this court by signing a bond with the Anita Terrace address on it, knowing full well that was no longer an address that he lived at, no longer an address he gets mail at, no longer an address that he's associated with in any way. And in fact, someone new is there. And if there's anyone out there that wants to try and find Kyle Rittenhouse, that might be the first place they look, and that person is potentially in jeopardy. So that was a very dangerous and irresponsible thing, a callous thing to do. And that's one of the things I wanted to bring to the court's attention so we can fix that and make sure that whoever's in that apartment is safe and isn't going to be bothered to the extent anybody's out there trying to bother Mr. Rittenhouse. But more importantly, we've got a bond violation here. 969.10 has not been complied with. And there's no dispute about that. The defense has acknowledged that. They've acknowledged that they failed to update the court with his address within 48 hours. He moved a couple of months ago, and they never bothered to update the court. Now, on, back in November, I had an email correspondence with Attorney Chirofsky, who was representing the defendant, about this very issue and whether or not they could keep his address confidential. And I advised Attorney Chirofsky to file a motion with the court. That is the proper procedure, Your Honor. If they confidential. They should have filed a motion. They should have filed that motion the moment Mr. Rittenhouse left the Annie Harris uh, residence. They should have filed it with this court and asked the court's permission. But instead, what they've done is gone ahead and done it unilaterally without any court authorization, without any notice to anyone here. They've acted independently. And frankly, this is the latest in a long line of, of incidents where I think the defendant is essentially thumbing his nose at the court's requirements here. And it's very alarming. When someone is facing these serious charges to go to a bar and drink, to wear a T-shirt with a profane message on it, to flash white supremacist signs, to move away from this address, put someone else at risk, and then refuse to disclose your whereabouts on a case like this, these are very troubling things. Now, I'm aware of the fact that under 969.035, the state could ask the court to revoke the defendant's bond. In fact, there was a protest last weekend People in the community asking us. To no, do no, that. I don't, no, 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 no. I don't want. No, no, I don't want to hear about protests. I don't want to deal with what media reports that are inaccurate. There were some very careless uh, reports in the paper the other day uh, after I issued uh, the restriction on associations. Uh, the media nationwide, I guess, portrayed it that I had pro prohibited the defendant from associating with white supremacist groups. There's nothing in the order about that. It would certainly be encompassed within what I ordered, but it was not limited. Uh, the, um, there was a report the other day uh, locally that said that uh, you, I think you had issued a warrant for the defendant's arrest. And um, well, I think that's what it said or something. The DA's office issued a warrant for his arrest. And um, and, you know, this kid, look, I want to have a fair trial in this case. And I want everybody, I mentioned this in my earlier order, I want everybody to act in a way 
that maximizes the possibility of fairness in this case, fairness to everybody who's involved. And I don't want to, this case is not going to be decided about by demonstrators of one type or another. And uh, frankly, I, it, it's not going to affect anything I do. And I, uh, um, uh, and I, I don't think it's going to, I, it's not, I don't want to whip stuff up. So it affects a fair trial in this case to decide it strictly on the evidence. So I don't want to hear about a demonstration last weekend, okay? Because if we do that, then next tomorrow we'll have a demonstration by people who view things differently, okay? And that's why I had filed a motion for a gag order in this case, which is still pending um, on all the parties, because this should not be how something that's tried a, a in the media. How do you gag a demonstration? How do you gag a street? How do you gag a street demonstration? The, the gag order was filed oh, when Attorney John oh, Pierce interviewed on national I, I, news about the case, Your Honor. That's why. But my point is the less, the, the less uh, anything other than just strictly discussing what the facts and the evidence are occurs, the more likely we are to have a trial that's fair to the defendant, which is his constitutional guarantee, and to the public, which is my responsibility. So Understood. I interrupted you. you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was, going to, I was just uh, making the point, Your Honor, that under 969.035, the court does have the ability to revoke bond in a case like this. However, uh, there is a burden on the state proved by clear and convincing evidence that it's necessary to protect the public or prevent the intimidation of witnesses. And at this point, I don't believe that I could meet that burden, which is why I didn't ask the court to revoke the bond here. However, I do think that there is a basis with the course of conduct that we've seen here for the court to impose a consequence for the defendant's violation of the bond, which has been admitted by the defense, uh, to increase his bond by $200,000. And until he does so, I think a warrant should be issued for his arrest. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take him to post that money, uh, but I think that that's something that needs to happen here, because otherwise, actually, there's no consequence. In it. Actually, there's a statute about warrants. There's a statute about warrants in these cases also. Um... 969.08, subsection 5A. A court may issue a warrant for the defendant who has already been uh, admitted to bond only if the district attorney complies with 969.08, subsection 5A, and that requires, number one, that the defendant was released on conditions, which is the case here. Number two, alleges the defendant violated a condition of release by committing a serious crime, which I haven't seen any uh, allegation of that. And number three, that the district attorney provides a copy of the complaint charging the commission of the crime. So you're short on two conditions in terms of my issuing a warrant. Now, tell me if I'm reading that statute wrong. No, you're, you're not, Your Honor. I'm not alleging the defendant has committed a serious crime. I'm simply alleging he's violated the conditions of his bond by failing to update the ad, his address with the court. Well, but it says, let's get the exact wording. Yeah, it says, um, if the court, this is subsection B, subsection 1, um, 969.08, subsection B, sub, subsection 1, if the court determines that the state has complied with paragraph A, the court may issue a warrant. That's the, that's the limitation on the court's authority to issue a warrant, is if the district attorney has complied with paragraph A. And paragraph A is what I just read, and you're missing two of the three ingredients that would be required to empower me to issue a warrant. Unless I'm reading that wrong, and I don't think I am. 
I understand, Your Honor. I am asking the court to increase the bond, however. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Is that it? Oh, I. Mr. Richards? That's all I have, Your Honor. I believe Mr. Ms. Richards. Motley uh, and, and a, uh, maybe Attorney Art, also on behalf of the victims, would like to give a, a brief statement as well. And uh, I would ask the you court. Know, you, know, you, know, you know that I don't permit the use of the term victim before adjudication in this or any other case, and I haven't for years. So please don't use that term. And I know this is an awkward situation, but uh, I, I do not permit the terms victim or uh, alleged victim unless and until there's been an adjudication. So these are folks who are speaking on behalf of the uh, families of the deceased. Your Honor, yes. John Huber is the father of Anthony Huber, who was killed by Mr. Rittenhouse, and he's here in yellow, and he would like to address the court if Your Honor will hear from him. Go ahead. Uh, would you identify yourself again, sir? Hello, my name is John Huber, and I am Anthony yeah. Huber's father. Okay, and can, if, would, would you do me the favor if, if it's okay, if there's nobody else there? Uh, it's going to be a lot easier for the court reporter if you remove the mask. I'm going to move mine anybody. if he removes his. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to, sir. <laughs> sir, I'm talking about the reporter. If I ask Mr. Uh, Mr. Kenner, uh, Mr. Uh, All right, here uh, I am. To speak, I, yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me better now? Yes, sir. Thank you. This is Mr. Huber. Go ahead, okay. sir. Well, from the beginning, from the moment he became a killer, he thought he was above the law. And he has no remorse for what he's done. And he is enjoying this media circus and the support from these hate groups and militia members that have posted his bond. Okay? It's not like his mom and dad put up the family house to get him out. He has nothing to lose if he runs. He has nothing to lose. Matter of fact, he's probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison if there's justice in that town of Kenosha. He should be remanded to custody. I don't know about what the what the DA was supposed to file, but this kid, we don't know where he is. You don't know where he lives. Nobody in that court knows where he lives. And if it's supposed to be a secret, then if he's got all this back in, what is he afraid of? He's got all these people supporting him. You know, why does he need to be in a safe house? His bond should be $4 million, like I said in the beginning. It should have been something that he can't just raise on his own. You know, and the people that did raise his money, I guess they're, they're not around anymore. But we lost a son. His mom and I lost our son. And how would you feel if the killer of your son is just able to walk free and make videos and bars and live it up? You know? Whatever the statutes are, they must be wrong because this guy can just go and do whatever he wants after he killed our son. Our son didn't get to spend Thanksgiving with us. But Rittenhouse did. He got to spend all kinds of time at the bar, live it up, making videos with his white supremacist friends, singing videos with a shirt that says free, free as F. You're not going to be free as F. Justice is going to be served to you. That's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Huber. Um, who wants to talk next? Your Honor, yes. if, uh, Ms. Motley? Thank you. Your Honor, if my client. Sorry, Motley. Um, yes. Your Honor, if my client, Mr. Grosscroy, I would like to say a few words and then I would like to speak after him if it's okay with the court. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Gage Grosskreutz. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir. Um, I think I'll... the reporter is having a little bit of difficulty, but just hold on, hold on one second. We're just having a technical issue here. Okay, now go ahead, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, again, my name is Gage Grosskreutz. 
Um, I'd like to uh, keep this brief. Um, first off, I'd like to echo um, the concerns and um, grievances that the uh, DA has provided, as well as the uh, clearly emotional issues um, that Mr. Huber has uh, just stated. Um, again, I would like to restate that it is in my opinion that Mr. Rittenhouse has shown a pattern of uh, lack of remorse during this um, during this bond time uh, before before trial, and uh, I would also recommend that the bail be raised to four million dollars. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Madley. Your Honor, um, thank you. And I, I would like to have my remarks on behalf of all of the victims that are present. I have been given Jan, permission I, of that. I, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm survivors. I'm sorry. You're this right. is a longstanding yes. rule. I, I it, appreciate it, that. it doesn't apply just to this case. I never permit right. this. And it's been for years. Uh, usually, it's we talk about the complaining witness. I understand this is a little difficult. Uh, but uh, the decedent or whatever, but I, I can't permit the use of the word victim or alleged victim because they're so lo loaded with with uh, uh, things that can't be uh, assumed prior to uh, trial. So go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. My apologies for that. Um, so I, I am speaking on behalf of the survivors, if that's a more acceptable term. Um, Mr. Huber has also given me permission to speak on his behalf, as well as obviously my clients, Mr. Gage Grosskreutz and the estate of Joseph Rosenbaum. We want to support uh, the state's motion, and we strongly believe that Mr. Rittenhouse's bail should also be substantially increased. We believe collectively as survivors that that increase should be at a minimum $4 million. We are very disturbed by his behavior in terms of what we believe is violations of his bail conditions. He should be giving his address. That is a basic requirement um, that I have seen as a criminal defense attorney and as an attorney for over 17 years of, of criminal defendants all around the world. And so why he feels that he doesn't have to give that address is beyond me when he signed his bail conditions on November 20th when that was set. We'd also ask the court to add additional conditions to his bail, to his bond, uh, his bail requirements. We believe that electronic monitoring is appropriate. We believe that I don't know if Mr. Rittenhouse has a passport, but if he does, that should be su surrendered or he should not have the ability to get a passport. We believe that his movement should be confined from home to his attorney's house office, excuse me, or, or court. Um, we're extremely disturbed like everyone else with the fact that Mr. Rittenhouse, as Mr. Huber has said, appears to be, um, I don't know, living it up. Um, I believe what was what he said, you know, going to bars, throwing up white domestic terrorist, white supremacist signs while, re while wearing inappropriate attire, in my opinion, chugging down three beers within a 90 minute time period is not something that we believe that he should be doing as a person that's facing over 200 years in prison. So we'd ask the court to take everything that we're all collectively saying in consideration that being out on bail essentially is a privilege. And Mr. Rittenhouse has shown time and time again that he does not care about his bail conditions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Richards. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, when one looks at the bail, first off, the exchange between the court and Mr. Binger, if this court today were to say to my client, I want you to post an additional $200, he would voluntarily return himself to jail. He is not running. He has not hid. Mr. Binger knew from the beginning he was not living at the address in Antioch. Mr. Sharafasi contacted him after to try to make arrangements to provide an address under seal. I find it ironic that Ms. Motley finds that so upsetting when her client, Mr. Grosswitz, has a sealed address in his Milwaukee County Court Circuit Court case. Your Honor, my client is not on, on trial. I, I, look, I don't want to get into a Milwaukee case involving anybody. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Move on to something else, Mr. Richard. My, my client 
when Mr. Binger talks about the Antioch address, Mr. Binger has said he wants proof of threats, clear, present, and tangible. Yet he's talking about this person in Antioch being somehow at risk. That makes no sense. It's intellectually dishonest. The notice went out to the Antioch address. It was returned. I note to the court, most important, that on January 5th for the arraignment, which was the notice, my client was in court through Zoom. He was in my office in a timely manner. He's made all of his court appearances. He knows the government is seeking to up his bond today. He's here. He's appearing via Zoom. That's how the court has required it. The fact that Mr. Binger uses the word unusual 15 to 20 times does not go into the bond statute. My client has filed under seal, and I'll fall on the sword. I should have been more diligent about getting that taken care of, but I didn't. Mr. Shiroffice, he reached out. It was unsuccessful. There were other attorneys involved. I should have made sure it was done. But as soon as I was served with these documents, we did provide a P.O. box, which is very close to his residence. He looks in that P.O. box, or his family does, daily. To believe that my client isn't at risk, we've provided the threats. All it takes is one crackpot, and there's a problem. My client has appeared for every court appearance. He has done what he's supposed to do. The bond has been updated, and if he moves again, we would update that. There's no notice to me under the statute regarding EML, ELM, or a passport. My client does not possess a passport. There's a substantial bond posted by people who support Kyle Rittenhouse. That is true. It's going on in another Kenosha County court case also. My client will appear. He looks forward to litigating these offenses in your Honor's courtroom. We have nothing to fear. The truth will set my client free. Thank you. If I could respond very briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead. Go ahead. First of all, counsel wants to put me at the center of this as if my knowledge is what matters, but I don't run the court. I'm not the judge, and the statute doesn't require him to notify me. It requires him to notify the court. This is a court order. This is a statute that isn't complied with. What I just heard from Attorney Richards is no defense, no argument that they complied with it. It's an acknowledgment that they didn't. They've just completely blown off this requirement. I had my suspicions he wasn't actually living there anymore, but as I explained earlier, I didn't know that that meant they'd completely flown the coop, and I certainly didn't know someone new had moved in there until I sent detectives down there to double check it after the court got its notice on January 28th. So that's the biggest point here, Your Honor. What the defense has filed is an address under seal, which is a P.O. box. It's not in Wisconsin or Illinois, so now we're even farther. I did look at that, and it actually looked like an address to me. You're saying that's just a P.O. box? On Google Maps, Your Honor, it's a P.O. box. Counsel's just acknowledged it's a P.O. box. I had my suspicions when I saw the format of the address. It didn't look like it would be a normal address. It's a P.O. box, Your Honor. So again, we don't know where an accused murderer's at. That's the bottom line here, Your Honor. The court doesn't know, and the defense is refusing to tell us where someone is accused of murder is located, and I think that's a problem. I'm not okay with that. The statutes don't contemplate that, and there's no dispute here. The defendant hasn't complied with this. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where are you? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. I wasn't understanding what you're saying. Go ahead. I got it now. I'm simply asking that this defendant be treated the same as everyone else, whether it's an OAR or a disorderly conduct or a drunk driving or a sex assault or a murder. Every defendant is required to provide this information. The defense has acknowledged they didn't do so. So now it's up to the court. What consequence is there going to be for this? Are we just going to turn a blind eye at this and let this go by? Or in this very, very serious case, are we going to hold the defendant to the same rules as everybody else and impose a consequence for us? And I believe that it's appropriate that the court impose the consequence that I've asked for, which is to increase the bond by $200,000. Now, I note, as the court mentioned, in 969.08, 
I think what the court was talking about there is the ability to arrest and hold the defendant without bond pending trial. Uh, and that's not what I'm asking for here. I'm simply asking that he be required to post the $200,000. And I think the court has to issue a warrant for his arrest to make him do that, because otherwise there's nothing com uh, compelling him to post that money. Oftentimes the courts will say you need to post it by a certain period of time, whether it's uh, five o'clock uh, next Tuesday or something along those lines. Um, but if, it, if he doesn't, then obviously there'd be a violation of the bond. There'd be an arrest warrant. There could be new charges on that. And I acknowledge we do have the ability to file bail jumping charges on the defendant for violating this bond. But in the big scheme of things, that goes back to the same point I was making earlier, which is there's not much of an incentive here. A class H felony for felony bail jumping pales in comparison to first degree intentional homicide charges, which is what the defendant's facing right now. So it's a very little incentive for him to continue to comply without the monetary incentive, without any legal recourse, the defendant can continue to flaunt these bond conditions and continue to act like none of this matters and he doesn't have to comply like everybody else. The behavior is disturbing here, Your Honor. This is a very serious case and I'm not sure the defendant is taking it nearly as seriously as he should. He should be held to the same rules, the same standards as everybody else. And when he violates a court order like he's done here and he admits he's done, there should be a consequence. Thank you. Your Honor, may I add something to that? Um, I'll go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, and, and joining in what the state said, you know, it, it, 30 days ago, the court, not this court, but there's another Kenosha County case involving also a double, hom a double homicide where, where a male of color was given a $2.5 million bond. $2.5 million. And we ask that the court also take that in consideration since Mr. Richards found it necessary to bring up something that was not re relevant to this proceeding. We think that this is relevant for the court to consider when setting the bond conditions and increasing the bail if the court so orders. Thank you. Well, I will tell you that uh, I am not going to decide anything in this case or any other on the basis of the color of anybody's skin, period. Um, uh, uh, there was a decision made, you know, in I think it was 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, where a decision was made on the basis of the color of someone's skin. A man who was, by the way, was one eighth African American descent, and it was a test case. And the Supreme Court of the United States, which has a spotted history on these issues, uh, I'll digress enough to talk about Roger Brooke Tawney saying that a black man could never be a citizen of the United States in 1854, which brought on the Civil War, and Plessy versus Ferguson, where Justice John Marshall Harlan issued a stirring dissent, dissent critical of the eight to one vote of the court to permit segregation in uh, by, by, by state law in transportation and, and said what an outrage it was and what, what harm it would cause to the country. And we suffered for a long time because of that, because decisions were permitted to be made on the basis of that. I don't know anything about that other case. I don't know who the judge was. I, I didn't set this bond and I didn't set that bond. And uh, so I'm not going to comment at all about that, other than to say this came, this case got, came to me. It had an in, initial bond of two million dollars set by Judge Wagner, who may be the same judge who set the bond you're talking about. I don't know. Uh, there was it was uh, reset by uh, by uh, Judge Keating at uh, first appearance, and uh, you know the, what's been reported to me now. Uh, he was not put on a condition of, of uh, living at a specific address that could have been done. The district attorney apparently was aware of what he now refers to as flying the coop, uh, was aware of that situation back then, and he didn't ask for a conditions on place of abode, and Judge Keating didn't order. So there's no change in circumstance there. Uh, and... Um, I'm, I do not believe it's proper to uh, issue a warrant. I don't think that would be lawful. No matter what feelings anybody has, I took an oath to uphold the Constitution and follow the laws, and that's what I'm going to do. 
And uh, it's sad that this is getting at the level it is, but I, I can't help that. I will tell you that um, um, the the uh, the violation uh, of uh, not well most of the people who are out on bond we don't know where they are there are people who are out on bond who are um, they're business people I think I've had cases where people are they do international business and they fly all over the world while they're out on bond and there's nothing prohibiting them in that bond this is a border county a significant portion of the people we have out on bond are living in Chicago or one of uh, the other collar counties um, and are in and out of Illinois every day. Um, so we don't have these restrictions on travel except when the judge, following the statute, puts an abode condition on. That was not done in this case. So he didn't violate anything like that. I don't have the authority to issue the warrant the district attorney is talking about, and I don't agree with his analysis of what the circumstances, or I should say the, uh, the procedure uh, for getting the bond changed. I get people in here and I do change their bonds, and uh, then I, I tell them uh, to post it by a certain time, or they have to report to the jail. If they don't report, that's when the warrant gets issued. But to issue a warrant now for a defendant who's appeared at every hearing, I'd, I'd, that would be a, a, I'd be breaking the law and I'm not going to do it. Um, I disagree with your statement that bail is a privilege. Bail is a right in the, in the Constitution. Um, and uh, he's posted the bail that was set. Now, he has, he's in violation of a condition about updating his address. I'm sorry, and are you talking, actually, is this all to me? I'm talking to just generally. Okay, got it. I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to everybody. Um, <clears throat> actually, if he'd have left a forwarding address, that probably would have been full compliance with the um, with the with the bond order because we're interested in an address where we can send notices to the defendant to appear uh, for a hearing or whatever the case may be. Um, he d apparently didn't leave a forwarding address, at least that's the evidence that was returned to the clerk. So he's in violation. I can tell you, and I talked to the clerk about this yesterday to confirm what I thought. Uh, there are a very, very, very high percentage of people who are out on bond who, when the, she routinely asks after a hearing is done, are you still living at the, the same address? And th the, I would estimate the number of cases where the person says yes is over 10%, maybe significantly more than that, um, where the people say, yes, I've got a new address, and they haven't notified the clerk. They're in violation. I've never jailed one of those people. I've never heard of any other judge jailing those people. I have never seen a... Uh, bond ju bail jumping violation based on one of those things. I've never seen the, the district attorney bring anything like that into the court. We amend their their um, their their uh, address on our records, and they might get barked at a little bit about violating the court's order. But that's the extent of what happens, and they don't get a raise in their bond of uh, of a 10% raise in their bonds. That's I can't recall that ever happening. I'm sure it hasn't. He didn't. He, so he is in violation for not updating his address, uh, and that has to be addressed going forward. Um, but he also, as Mr. Richards has pointed out, he appeared on the, the last hearing, which was the one uh, which was the return notice. He was there at uh, Mr. Richards' office. <clears throat> so I'm assuming he came from wherever he was, to uh, uh, to uh, Racine, Racine to attend that meeting, and uh, he's here today. So uh, I'm going to deny the motions. Um, I I do think that I, I I understand the concern, 
And my heart goes out to everybody who was involved. This is a terrible thing, and that's one of the reasons I feel so strongly I want it to be handled uh, peacefully and and uh, fairly and impartially. And and part of that, that's a small part of it, is uh, the the risk that there would be uh, the kind of concern that the defense has talked about in terms of the safety of the defendant. Um, and quite apart from the interests of the defendant, after what this town has been through <clears throat> in, the, in the last six months, I don't want any more problems. The police don't need any more problems. We don't need to have people's safety in jeopardy in any way. So I think that uh, the desire that the bond uh, or that the defendant's address be kept um, from public scrutiny uh, is a legitimate one. And uh, what I'm going to order is that the actual physical location of the defendant, uh, and it will be his place of abode, he, if he's going to remove from there, he'll have to follow the bond condition and give us the exact physical location of his place of abode. Um, and that is to be given to the deputy clerk working in this court who will keep it privately. It will not be part of the public record. It's to be given to me. It'll be held the same way. And it's to be given to whomever the sheriff designates as um, the commanding the person who would be responsible for full knowledge of the uh, whereabouts of the defendant. Uh, and that is to be kept secret by the, the uh, sheriff's office. So um, is that clear, Mr. Richards, what's required? It is, Your Honor, and you and your clerk will have that by 5 o'clock today, and I will have it to the sheriff's department as soon as I'm told who to designate it to. Okay. Your Honor, I would also... Uh, any information be yeah. shared with our office, too, please. No. The district attorney's office and the answer is no. Um, it's not, that's not a, that has nothing to do with you or your office. I, I, I think the sheriff would be your, your right arm, left arm, whichever is preferred, um, in discharging anything that would need to be done. Uh, and uh, they're not to share it with you unless you offer good reason. And it's not that I don't trust you. I think that the, again, the less uh, 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 of this, uh, the safer everybody is. As I said, you remember what went on six months ago here? I've got two broken windows here, right here in this courtroom. The doors are all still covered with plywood. A good share of the community is still um, boarded up after millions of dollars of damage, of property damage and this ghastly event occurred. So no, I don't want anything that might uh, kindle further violence. Uh, and so no, uh, and it's not a reflection in any way on you or your office. Your Honor, um, I, I hope you're not suggesting that sharing this information with our office is somehow going to lead to further violence uh, because we would not be in any way contributing to that, but our obligation is to help monitor the defendant's bond conditions and without knowing where he's at, that becomes very difficult. If I'm to file a, I, a charge of felony bail jumping, for example, for the defendant violating his bond and I don't know where he's at, that makes it pretty difficult. Uh, and if the court has placed the- And you call the court? And, and, and you call the court? criticize me for not doing so in the past, then I feel like I need to have this information. And certainly no one on this Zoom call needs to be reminded of the events of six months ago. We have the loved ones of, of two deceased and a victim who was shot in the arm by the defendant that night. So don't you please well, don't use the term victim. The, the, the Mr. Mr. Grosskreutz was shot in the Any arm. Witness. Your Honor, if Mr. Binger wants my client, if what's that? If my client, if Mr. Binger wants my client to appear on what he's going to do next, which is issue a felony bail jumping, send it to my office, he'll be in court the next day. This posturing is not serving any purpose at this point. The court has ruled.
Your Honor, it's not posturing. This is standard procedure in all criminal cases that everybody knows where the defendant is. This is highly unusual for this to be withheld under seal. The court has ruled that it can be sealed from the public, but we are not the public. We are the prosecuting agency. We are the prosecutors on this case, and we have a, a very important right to know this information as the prosecuting agency here in Kenosha County. And I have never heard of a situation where this information has been withheld from our office. The Sheriff's Department, you're right, is a law enforcement agency, but we work with them and to withhold them from giving to us, the court not giving it from us, to cut us out of that information is is not appropriate here. We are, our office is headed up by the elected DA, the law, chief law enforcement officer in this community. This is a murder case, and we are entitled to this information, Your Honor. We have never been denied this information in any case that I've ever heard of. And I, if the court is aware of a case in its history where you've not shared this information with us, I would appreciate you sharing that with us, letting me know what case that was, because this is highly irregular. We have a right to know this. I would argue the public has a right to know it as well. I understand the court's ruling from sealing it from the public, but our office has a responsibility to enforce the laws, enforce the bond here, to file bond uh, uh, bail jumping charges if there's a violation of that, and we cannot do our job without this information. If the sheriff can keep on top of this as to whether there's a violation, that's where most of your information, when I was district attorney, and I know it's been a long time, but I didn't have any investigative uh, staff except one investigator, which I won't go into, but um, the sheriff's department was in charge of reporting bond violations and the like to, uh, to, to us, and I think the same situation is true now. Hearing's over. Thank you. The defendant doesn't reside in Kenosha County, Your Honor. The sheriff can't help me. Because he doesn't Thank reside. you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm going to still be on Zoom, so I just, yeah, yeah, we'll leave. Uh, I have a recorded. You don't mind my having you have that secret address, do you? 